Now, switching to the Beatles, who are without a doubt one of the greatest and most influential bands of the rock and roll era. And though they were together for less than 10 years, the love and loyalty of their fans has only grown with time. This weekend, the Fest for Beatles fans arrives in Chicago, attracting folks from all over the world. And we're glad to welcome one of the local participants, author and pop culture historian Robert Rodriguez. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Well, thanks for having me. And you have written a fifth book about the Beatles, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But tell us what happened, what the musical landscape was like 50 years ago this month when the Beatles first had their, their big hit. Well, they had had, with their second single release, Please Please Me in England, that went to number one, followed by From Me To You, which went to number one. But what really crystallized their success was the recording and issue of She Loves You, which was in August of 63, so that was 50 years ago. They started out the month playing their last gig at the Cavern Club, you know, the local underground venue that they really made a reputation in Liverpool at. And they ended the month releasing She Loves You, which became a mammoth hit record and number one in England. How did they change the musical land landscape at that moment, or was it building up gradually to this moment? It was building. They'd done their apprenticeship in Hamburg, Germany with a different drummer, but that was where they learned when they were playing seven nights a week, six hour stints, how to really hold an audience, how to be creative, how to project charisma and energy. And through the miracle of working with George Martin, that transferred to the grooves of the vinyl that they were issuing. And it's for no, not for no reason, you listen to those early records today and they really pack that energy into the grooves. And by the time they issued She Loves You, their fourth single, they had really gotten it down. They really were old hands at the game and the country and the world was finally starting to catch up with them. And that was uh, six months or so before they set foot in America and went on the Ed Sullivan Show and things skyrocketed even more from there. But Ed Sullivan had seen them before uh, they, they came to America. Yeah, that was how they got booked. It was in the fall of 63. He was in London and he was uh, happened to be there at the same time that the Beatles were coming home from a stint in Sweden where they just you know started really spreading their worldwide fame and following. And um, he saw this huge crowd at the airport and he was thinking that what's who's coming to town? Is this the Queen or the Prime Minister or something? No, it's this group called the Beatles. And he's like, what's the Beatles? And that piqued his curiosity and he was always looking for something not Novel, especially from Europe to book on his show and Brian Epstein the Beatles manager got in touch and they hashed it out it's worth noting that the Beatles got booked for three straight headlining appearances in early 64 before they had a hit record in America by the time they and landed that was unprecedented that was yeah it was like they were they were booked as a novelty act basically with funny haircuts by the time they landed in February of 64 at JFK Airport their record I Want to Hold Your Hand was the number one single in the country. It was the perfect storm. Who coined the term Beatlemania? That was the English press, and that was also 50 years ago this coming fall in October. That was when they played what was sort of the e English equivalent of the Ed Sullivan Show, meaning this Sunday night forum that everybody in the country watched, which was Monday night at the Sunday, or Sunday night at the London Palladium, and that was Everybody watched that. There was like riots outside the theater when they were playing, and that was what the newspapers talked about the next day. Beatlemania has erupted, and you know it's been in use ever since. Well, here we are, 50 years later, uh, for, uh, after their, their their first hit, big hit, really. Are, are Beatles fans like you? Although I'm a Beatles fan, but probably not as uh, steeped in, in in the lore as you are. Are you still learning new things about the Beatles that is revelatory? Well, it's funny that stuff continues to surface. Um, more facts and details of their career. Um, photos are still surfacing to this day that people hadn't seen before. There were snapshots that came out earlier this year that surfaced online um, taken during the Abbey Road sessions in 1969, the last time the Beatles worked together as a band, also in the month of August, you know, that this very anniversary month. Um, before going their separate ways, although they didn't let the public know that for another six months or so. But your last two books, and you've written five altogether uh, uh, on the Beatles, have been about what happened after the breakup and their solo careers. Yes. Why focus on their solo careers? Were they just as important as the, the Beatles era? I think so. I think there's plenty of great stories from the solo years. Um, I focused on that first decade. 1970, the breakup was announced. 1980, John Lennon was murdered, and that shut the door with finality on any possibility of them reuniting, which was all, all the public clamored for during those 10 years. It didn't matter what they achieved during those years. You know, George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, John Lennon Imagine, Wings Over America, Ringo, number one album with Photograph, and uh, You're 16 on it. Um, 
the question would always be, you know, this is great what you just put out, but when are the Beatles getting back together? And it was this shadow that they had to operate under, you know, for the entirety of the decade until John's death. And the reality is they did come close. They talked about it amongst themselves, about doing something together, but it was never going to be something imposed by outsiders. Like, here's $50 million, get together and do one show and we'll uh, broadcast it by satellite. They always found that sort of tacky. Tell us about Beatles Fest, because it actually started in the 70s, didn't it? It did. It started for the 10th anniversary of them coming to America, 1974, by a Sam Goody store manager named Mark Lapidos, and uh, he wanted it as a 10th year commemoration in 1974. He personally tracked down John Lennon in New York, knocked on his hotel room door, and got his blessing to start the fest. And John's like, I'm fine with it. I'm a Beatles so fan myself. So that story is true. It's that's not urban true. legend. No. And Harry Nilsson was the guy who opened the door. And so they brought it to Chicago starting in 1977. Um, Terry Hemmert has been emceeing it, I think, pretty much for the duration of that time in Chicago when it started at the Palmer House. And this weekend it's in Rosemont. And they've got some veterans from the British invasion, Chad and Jeremy, Billy J. Kramer, Joey Mullen from Badfinger, um, some artists, Georgina Flood and Eric Cash, um, some other book writers, Larry Kane, the journalist from Philadelphia, has got a new book out. And do you find that the younger generation still is drawn to the Beatles? It's always going to be new to somebody, you know, because it's, it's, it's like laying there to be discovered and become so much a part of the cultural landscape. It's just something like the sun. It's like just there. And it's going to be fresh because those records, if you compare them to their peers in the 60s who were working this, you know, the same time they were, they still have this freshness to them. They still have this energy and they still grab you. And you couple that with the fact that the Beatles were you know, so charismatic, you know, they made some great films. They were the whole package as entertainers and as a cultural phenomenon. And that will never ever get old. Now arguably Paul McCartney has been the most successful in the post-Beatles era. At least he still endures, he still plays, you see him on TV, or he's going on tour. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that he's, he's, his legacy will be the one that most endures? I don't think he will ever escape the shadow of what he did in his 20s as a Beatle. Yes, he's had phenomenal success. He's a bit of a workaholic. And you know, having just seen him in Miller Park last month, he does an amazing show at the age of 71. I don't say that lightly. I went in as a skeptic, and he totally blew me away. Um, but the Beatles never had to issue a song called Silly Love Songs to sort of defend their work. And so I think he will never quite get the respect that he did as a Beatle simply because he might not have implemented the same quality control that the Beatles did when they were a foursome. But he still puts on a good show after all these years, yes, which is does. important. Great energy. Robert Rodriguez, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And on our website, you can find an excerpt from Robert Rodriguez's latest book. It's called Solo in the 70s, as well as his picks for the best solo albums by John, Paul, Ringo, and George. You'll also find Wild Chicago's Illinois Road Trip, which features a visit to Benton, Illinois, one-time home of George Harrison's sister. This cultural connection on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate, Chicago's own good hands.